Okay, welcome to Orchid Capture for students. We are now into the second tutorial. In this tutorial, we're actually going to now start looking at how to design, do a quick design using schematic capture, the, the Orchid schematic capture uh, as our software. Um, the, the end result of this stage is that you, you have produced a schematic, such as what we're going to do. We're going to work on this design right here. Um, and then the end result of this this phase is are going to produce what's called a netlist and then, then in ORCAD the netlist is encapsulated onto a board file dot brd file that is placed on in your project folder and I will show you later that on when that happens um, then another thing we need to do is that after we have uh, uh, designed the schematic we need to annotate the schematic I'm going to show you how to do that and then the most important part and this is where the difficulty in using ORCAD really begins because it's not exactly straightforward like it is in other EDA tools um, that's on the assigning of footprints to parts and we talked about what what, what what was the footprint? It was basically the physical uh, mapping from the schematic symbol into the actual uh, pattern that that uh, that it takes place in the board itself, in the physical board. Again, we looked at uh, let's look at the, uh, some uh, footprints again. We looked at this in uh, <coughs> in the first video and. Uh, when we look at the images, um, I show you this particular image, in fact. Um, and basically, this is the footprint. So we need to assign a proper footprint into our symbols, and, and that's where the complication really begins. Where as far as drawing the schematic in ORCAD is a very simple um, thing to do. So let's just go ahead and get started. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. So here we're going to start drawing phase one, which is drawing the schematic itself of our three-bit design. And then let me just show you an image of where we're going with that, which is this circuit. We're going to use this circuit. We're going to replicate it three times to produce a three-bit um, register. Okay, and it's going to be a hierarchical design. That means inside of each of these is, you know, is that is that circuit structure I showed you previously. But instead of drawing the circuit three times, we're just going to copy paste and use occurrences to uh, complete the design and not do all the work that is required to do so. So when we start Orchid Capture, and this is version 16.6, .6, and it's the light version, it's the free version. You can download it from Orchid after you register with them. You are welcome onto the start page, which we are not interested in. But if you are, you can just click tutorial, and which is I don't want to see it. So let's just go ahead and close it. Um, the first thing you want to do is file new project. Well, actually, what you want to do first is you want to set your design template. So we go to options, design template. And this here controls everything that's related to the page itself. Each time you add a new design page onto your project, it will take on these properties. So you can set the font styles for each of the elements, you know, different types of elements that you can add onto your design. The title block is the most important. Make sure you fill it out. So under title, I put Orca title. Um, this information is already here from my previous session. Okay, but if you need to change it, make sure that you change this. So we have ORCAD tutorial, uh, organization name, University of Nebraska Lincoln, organization address, I put Jay Santos, and then there's additional fields that you can enter, and I had put this for experimentation, but we really don't need that. I'm going to leave these empty. Document number one, revision one. The default title block name is title block two. How do you know that? I'm going to show you. Let's just leave this as it is for now. Please note that there's a page size so that you can determine the units are in inches and millimeters. Uh, the, some of the default standard page sizes available. I normally like to work, work with 11 by 17, but for this design, because it's simple, we can get away with 8.5 by 11. I like large sheets. I don't like small ones. Um, you know, additional, you can configure your grids uh, and that's really the most important part. You know, the most important part of, of, of the design template is set in your title block because this information will be automatically appended on every page that you add. And then, of course, the size. These two, title block and page size. Anyways, let's go ahead and click OK. That's set up, and that will remain persistent 
throughout any project we create so you have to remember to change that before you start a new project anyways let's go ahead and start a new project I'm gonna move this so that you can see the menu so we're gonna do file new project okay the new project requester will come up we want to make sure we select PC board wizard because we're just going to do a straight PC board design project we're going to do the schematic and then convert it to the PCB and finish it there that's it no simulation uh, which is what this is for and we're not just going to stay on a schematic okay browse select a location where the project files will be placed this is very important know where they are so um, you need to create a, or, a, a folder or ORCAD which is stash all the files wherever you select it so I have selected my ORCAD project folder but I need a new double click on it make sure it's selected create a new directory and I'm just gonna call this ORCAD tutorial hit enter make sure you select it don't forget to select it please now it is selected so I can go ahead and click OK and now that's selected there and for the name of the project I'm gonna call it ORCAD tutorial again I'm gonna hit OK then you will be asked whether you want to enable simulation again I do not want to do any simulation I just want to draw the schematic and eventually do PCB layout so next you are asked whether you want to include libraries each of these libraries contains components that you can add onto your design okay for the light version there's only a limited set of libraries but I'm going to show you how to add this on a as needed basis so I'm not I'm not gonna add anything I'm just gonna hit finish and I'm gonna slide this back and here we have and automatically we have I'm gonna go ahead and maximize this we have our schematic page and I'm going to uh, use the, the you can use the scroll bar I mean the scroll button on your mouse to scroll up and down you can hit you can hold out the control button to uh, zoom in and out and you can hold the control shift while using the scroll bar um, Uh, to you know uh, go left and right okay pan left and right okay so notice that our title bar has this default information that we put in our design template okay so that's why that's there now let's move on to the project manager all right right now we have our design file which contains only one schematic page that schematic page is already designated as the root or the top level schematic which is indicated by the forward slash we expand that. That schematic has already one page attached, which is our page one, which is already here with this. Um, let's see. View. So, go to the page, edit, view, grid. I want to see the grid. Okay. It's kind of hard to see, but it's there. Um, and then I'm going to hit select a folder. I'm going to right click. I'm going to rename it to top because this is going to be our top level design. Okay. Um, so we have an empty page, and now we're ready to go ahead and add parts. To add parts, you can either hit to place a part. You can hit the P button, or you can just go here, select place part. So when you click that, you will have the place part panel, which will appear and the library's design cache is going to basically cache all the parts that you use throughout your design so that you can find them quicker right now there's nothing in the cache because we haven't used anything and we have no library so we're going to be using connectors um, a variety of connectors and uh, some logic devices uh, simple stuff so to add a library you need to click on the add library icon which is kinda hard to see but it is in there and then it should automatically take you to the library folder within ORCAT installation okay and what we're interested is in we're going to need connectors so I'm gonna select the connector library notice that that gets added to the list and we can see all of the components that are part of that one library okay we're going to need um, let's see gates for logic gates click that hit open and now we also have logic gates added to the list okay you need to select the library 
before you select a component. And uh, let's see. Um, and then we might need discrete. Discrete is for like resistors, capacitors. We won't use it because we have no resistors and capacitors in our design. But uh, just so that you know, that's there. Okay. So let's see. Then you can type. Uh, so again, we're going for this. So we wanna, we wanna start working on this structure here. So we're going to go ahead and go to the project manager, design, and we're gonna right click, and then we're gonna say new schematic, and let's call it the flip flop subsystem, or subsys. Click OK. We have a folder, but it has no pages. So again, right click, new page. It will automatically be page one. Click OK. Control S to save, and it gets saved. Uh, let's go to that page. We're going to start adding parts. So, what we need is a, let's start with a 7402. So, if we go to gate, you can type meta characters, I believe. So, star 7402. Let's see if that works. Star. Uh, let's see if we do 7402. It automatically found it and it automatically added, but I don't want to do that. I want to hit the escape button. I want to see it, the library. Oh, there it is. Okay, so we, if you, when you click on it, the symbol is shown down here. So again, I'm gonna, and then these parts have subparts, you know, because they're part of the same chip package. So for example, there are four gates on one chip package and you can decide which one you want to start with but let's start with A. So I'm going to need two so I double click and I click click and then hit escape to abort any further placement then I also need a 7400 so there it is but I double click it or press enter and then I'm going to place one here and another one here escape then I'm going to need a 7404. So there it is. I double click. And then I'm going to place it about right here. Whoops, I didn't mean to do that. Escape. So let's go ahead and select it and press the delete key. And it's gone. Then we can select this whole thing and we can rearrange them a little better on the page. And then we want to go ahead and organize the uh, device numbers and the reference designators. So so that they're a little bit closer to the body of the symbol. They're a little bit too spread out for my taste. So that way we don't lose so much space. Same here for the inverter. That should be good enough. Okay, and now we want to go ahead and start wiring it. So I can go ahead and click and, and just while holding the mouse, I can just drag the part as needed. Same here. I want to line them up so that I, there's a minimal uh, uh, number of turns, you know. Um, so I want to connect it with wires. And to do so, I just hit the wire key, W, on my keyboard. Or you can just go right here and, uh, oops, this one, place wire. So I'm just going to hit the W key, cursor changes, click, 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 click. Um, then I want to bring click, 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 click again, click again, and click. And then I want to bring this over here, click, And there you go. We have those connected. Press the escape key on your keyboard to exit that. I want to bring these two a little bit closer. You don't need to be too far apart. We can click on segments and I can drag them to move them. Make more effective use of space, but you also don't want to sacrifice clarity. Um, then once again, I want to keep putting adding wires. So I hit the W key. Click, click, click. Whoops click click and uh, I want to have a wire extending out double click to end the current segment um, 
then let's go ahead and add this here escape to exit let me drag this over further this way and then I'm gonna hit the W key again to add another wire from here to there escape we're done and then I'm gonna need output wire so I'm gonna hit the W again to add another wire from here double click click double click when you double click you in a current segment that you're not in ex exactly on top of another node I'm going to click here and drag this a little bit closer. Okay, anything to add to the clarity of the design. And maybe we want to go ahead and select it all and just kind of keep this centered. Okay, now we want to go ahead and remember this is going to be part of a hierarchical design. The, the uh, interface between the outside world and the inside world in our hierarchy are hierarchical ports. And these are added by way of the place port icon. So I'm going to go ahead and click on that and I need two outputs. First make sure that Capson library is selected so that we don't we don't look at both the Capson and the design cache uh, components and we want I think it's port right first. So these are going to be outputs. We click OK and we're going to drop one here and one here and escape to exit that. We're going to click uh, place board again and now we're gonna have on the left side let's see the right side and click OK and we need one here and I realize that we're gonna need another one another wire but I'm gonna go ahead and place the port escape I'm gonna hit the W key to add another wire from my port to this net escape to exit Notice that inputs, when you're drawing a schematic, the proper approach is that signals are coming from the left and they propagate and exit on the right. And also the ports, I see this being abused a lot on other designs, both um, uh, uh, amateur and professional, is that you have to have the right symbol. This symbol is used, it shows the directionality of, sometimes I see the same symbol being used for both inputs and outputs, and that is, to me, that's just incorrect. Um, let's go ahead and relabel this for their purpose. If you double click on the label, oh actually, sorry, if you click on the port and double click on it, the uh, component, the, the uh, um, attribute editor uh, window comes up, okay? The property editor, sorry. But let's go ahead and dismiss that because I want to edit all four ports at the same time. So I'm going to right click and close it. And I'm going to hold the control key as I select each one. So let me deselect everything. And so hold the control key, click click, 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 and then I can say uh, control E to bring me to the uh, property editor panel. And what I want to do is, um, actually I did this the wrong way, let's go ahead and dismiss this again. I don't know which is, if you, if let me do that again to show you. Control E, I don't know which is which. Obviously I don't know you know you need to rename them first so let's go ahead and close them so obviously this is going to be my I don't know why I'm having problems I think that the, the, there we go so that's going to be my queue and then double click on it Double click, and it's going to be my D for data, and double click, and my CLK for clock. And then go ahead and drag this closer. Okay, we need to know what, what's what, and you won't know unless you label them first. So now after they have their unique labels, control, click, 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 control E, property editors, now I know what's what. Anyways, I want to set the the type. Obviously my clock and data are inputs but my Q and Q naught are outputs. So output, output. Okay. Hit apply. You can also press control P, excuse me. And then after you're done, control S to save. And let's go ahead and dismiss this window and let's get back to where we are. So we have now the one bit flip-flop in place, our structure. Let's get back to our top level schematic and we're going to add a manifestation of this circuit as way of a higher by way of a hierarchical block onto our top level design. So 
to do so, we're going to go to here and plus place a hierarchical block. So I click on it, and then the reference means reference designator. So FF1, you know, flip flop one. Uh, if this is a primitive, let's say no, because we want to be able to descend into the hierarchical block. Okay, the implementation, that means that this block is going to implement a schematic. Okay, and the implementation name already exists, it's called FF subsist, which was the name we gave our schematic name. Now, in older versions of ORCAT, this will not automatically show, so you have to go back to your project manager window, make a note of the name, and then type it in yourself. But here we're good. We click OK. The minute you do, the cursor will change so that you can draw the block. And you just draw it at any size and then click click again. And then notice that we have our hierarchical block. And remember the two inputs and the two outputs. You can actually click on and then move these as needed. And then, of course, we can click on the boundary or around it. And then we can kind of resize this something uh, meaningful. So here's the name of the schematic, here's the occurrence of this particular hierarchical block. Okay, I'm gonna back up a little bit so that I can place this one in the middle and then zoom in only again. And I'm gonna click it, it's already selected, so Control c to copy and then Control v to paste. So we do one, notice that the reference designator automatically increases or increments by one, again Control b to paste again, and there it is, escape and we have that. Now there's something I want to show you, and I'll show you how to fix it later, but notice that when I descend into the schematic, I have the reference designators of, you know, U3A, U2B, U2A, U1A, and I go back here and I descend onto FF2, and notice that it has the same reference designator numbers. That's not good, we want to change that, but we will later, but I just want you to notice that. So right now these occurrences are not necessarily unique, and they need to be. Okay, so we have our design, we need, we need, uh, <coughs> we need now to uh, go ahead and start adding some connectors, okay? So we want to go ahead and add a 4-pin connector, because we have 3 data inputs and a clock, and we have 3 data outputs for uh, regular and inverted forms. So for that we go to the connector library and I'm just going to use the 4-pin uh, connector here. Okay, so if I double click it, there it is, um, I can place one connector here. Oh, I want to show you something. Uh, as you're placing parts, you can hit the R key to rotate the part. Okay, or you could right-click and mirror horizontally or vertically whenever you need to mirror the component. Um, and actually, in fact, I am going to do that. So um, let's see if I just place it. I want the pin one to be on the top. So I'm going to go ahead and click this, and I'm going to uh, rotate. First, I need to rotate it, and there it is. Pin one is on the top. I'm going to put this about over here. Um, I'm going to back up. I'm going to actually make a copy and paste it. Copy, paste, but now I want to mirror it. So I'm going to go ahead and, well, you need to, let's see, place the part and then right click, mirror horizontally. Notice that my pin one is also on the top here. I'm going to place it right about there. Okay, now uh, I need a two-pin device for my power and ground. So for that, I'm going to find a connector or a two-pin header. I think it's a two-pin header. Right here, header two-pin. I'm going to double-click and use that. I'm just going to place it about right here and then escape to finish. Okay. I'm going to start, let me kind of center that about right here. I'm going to need another one of this, so copy, paste. There it is. Now, I have three data lines, so wire, double click, click, double click, click, double click. That's going to be my data. And uh, I'm going to need those lines. I'm going to connect them over here. And my third line is going to be my clock. 
So for the clock, I'm going to click, click, come all the way down here and add it to that and then connect this clock here. And let's just hook up the clock to that line. Okay. Um, then the data. I'm going to collect the data into a bus. To do that, we need bus entries, okay, which is this guy right here. Place bus entry, or you can press the E key for entry. So I press E, there's my bus. You can press the R key to rotate or the spacebar. Um, oh, sorry, no. The control Z. E, R to rotate. So I'm going to click, click, click. And then I'm going to press R to orient it, so click, click, click. Okay, escape to finish, and I'm going to place the bus. To place the bus, you click on the place bus diagram or hit the B button for bus. So B, and I'm going to click here, here, there, uh, something happened, control Z, let's try it again, B, click, and then before I click for my second one, I'm going to hold down the shift key. The reason is so that when I click, um, uh, that didn't work, control Z, I can't remember if it's shift or control key. Why am I having problems here? B, bus, shift. When I hold down the shift key, I can do 90 angle, or arbitrary actually, 45 degree turn, so there, 45, I'm still holding the shift key the whole time, um, and then click there, and an automatic connection will be made on those bus entries, which we overlap. Okay, that's done there. Now we need wires on this side, two, four, R, and instead of doing three wires, I'm going to select this wire, I'm going to copy, paste it, click, paste it, click, okay, paste it, click, paste it, click, paste it, click, escape, and then I'm going to select these three, I'm going to copy, paste, I'm going to hit those right there, okay, so then uh, copy, oops, escape, select, Copy, paste, paste, paste. Bus entries. E, R, root, rotate, click, 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 rotate, click, 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 click. Escape. Notice that the bus entries orient themselves in the general direction of the bus, where the bus is coming from. Okay? Anyways, um, I don't want to connect, so we have a problem, we need to move these. So I'm holding the control key as I select these, and then I'm going to go ahead and move these back a little bit, because I want to have two different buses. Alright, so I'm the same same thing here, we might have to move these, but let's just wait for a moment here. Um, B, hold down the shift key, click, 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 and then I'm going to stop right there, escape, and then we're going to need, I think that instead what I'm going to do, hold on the control key, and I'm going to move these this side. And they don't connect with the bus because that's what the bus entry is for. The, the, the program can determine whether, uh, you know, whether you intend to connect to the bus by way of the bus entry. Uh, so again, B, hold down the shift key, click, click, I turn at 90 degrees, and I'm going to stop it right there. That means I have to bring these bus entries there, and then I have a connection. So now I have my buses placed. Um, just move that diagram and again beautifying it as much as I can. Notice that I have some connectors here that are not going to be connected. Okay, I don't want the schematic program to flag this as an error. I want to let it know that this is an intentional 
uh, on my part to leave this behind so I can do the note connect place note connect or hit the X key and then I click there and I click there that means it is my intention to leave those pins unconnected okay I'm going to go ahead and select this here and just kind of bring it down a little bit more so that it lines up with this over here again beautifying it um, I like my diagrams to be clean um, okay now how does the bus know that what wire gets connected to what? All we see is that three wires go into a bus and then I don't know is this wire connected to this one or is it connected to this one or is it connected to that one okay to solve that problem we need to add net labels okay and which we do by adding uh, let's see is there a net label well, this place text um, right here place net alias which you can do by hitting the N key again net everything has makes sense N is for net alias B is for bus W is for wire X is for not connect anyways N is to add a net label and I want to connect data lines so I'm gonna say this bus connects data lines from 0 dot dot to 2 this is very important because the format of the names of the individual wires has to match the format of the bus so I click OK, and I you have to make sure you click on the bus. All right? Escape, and now I'm going to hit N again. But now I'm going to label the individual wires D zero, okay. And now I click on the wire D zero, D one, D two. Each time you click, the net label number will automatically increment. This is neat. Okay, Escape. You could. I'm going to start again. N D0 hit enter once again D0 D1 D2 I don't like it the fact that the clock wire is in the way so I'm gonna click there control click there and then I'm gonna move this wire there clarity 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 okay we have everything labeled here now we know that this bus collects the wires D0 to D2 and that D0 here is connected to D0 out here, D1 here is connected to D1 here, D2, D2 in there. There you go. We repeat the process on the other side, so I'm going to do this real quickly again. N, Q, bracket, 0, dot, dot, 2, bracket, hit enter. That's this guy over here. And again, N, let's say Q, N, for Q0, bracket, 0, dot, dot, 2, bracket okay make sure the bus is selected okay now label the individual wires n q 0 enter q 0 q 1 q 2 repeat n q 0 enter 0 1 2 escape n q n zero enter whoops let's do it right here q and zero q and one q and two repeat n q n zero enter zero one two escape i don't like that i have my net labels here so let's see what can we do here q q q and then i'm going to drag them over here I can. The problem is Control Z. The problem is that this bus here needs to move. So let's see if we can do that without affecting our design. We don't want to. We want to just move this part here. There we go. Now I can go ahead and select the net labels, and now I can move it. Net. These net labels have to be really close so that it's clear. We don't want to lose that information in clutter. Control S. Okay, now we need power and ground. Well, if you have been paying attention, where is power and ground? Actually, we don't see it. If we descend into the hierarchy, even our circuit here has no power and ground. Where's the power and ground? Well, in ORCAD, some of the devices can actually opt to have the power and ground lines uh, hidden. In fact, if I take this device and double click on it, and down here we select 
pins, you will notice that there are two pins called ground and BCC. Those pins are there, but they're not visible. Okay. So we need those needs to be connected. But we don't do that directly. There is no pin that we can connect it to. So we need to do that indirectly. I uh, will show you how. If you go back to the top level page over here, this is gonna pin connected for a pin. Um, we're gonna add a power and ground um, net labels. These are special power labels. So if you hit the F, you can go here and hit the F key if you want. And we want to select BCC. And there's various forms of BCC. I like to use BCC bar for my BCC. I'm just gonna put it up here and escape. Double click on the name so that we can change that to purely BCC. Okay, we can connect a wire. So pin one will be our high supply, and in our ground, you can hit the G key and select the ground symbol. Okay and hook up the ground and make sure we place a wire from that there. These power nets are global nets. So that means when power comes here, let's say we hook up a battery to this connector or some kind of a, of a power supply, wherever there is a pin anywhere in our entire design that has a BCC net label, it is automatically connected to it even though there is no physical line that goes from here to all the power pins. So this is actually physically connected to BCC. This, because it is named ground, as we can see in the label when I hover my mouse pointer over it. Okay, any pin that has also has a net label or pin name of ground will be connected, even though there is no physical connection. So now by, by virtue of the fact that I have a BCC and ground, the pins on all of my logic devices that have BCC and ground, so let me click, control click these three, Control E, and if we go to the pins, all of these devices have a ground and BCC. Okay, ground BCC, ground BCC, and even though there is no physical connection anywhere in the diagram, there is actually a connection by way of a global net. Okay, we are almost done with as far as connectivity goes. Let's just go ahead and beautify this. So let's move this a little bit closer. Um, four pin header is not really very descriptive. So if I double click on it, Let's go ahead and just change these to uh, uh, input, okay? For our data input, um, let's double click on this and select supply. Call it supply since our power supply. Let's bring this closer, okay? Um, let's go over here. Let's leave this alone. Let's change this to output. And let's change this to output not. Okay, and let's just kind of move this again. Have things line up as much as you can. Use symmetry wherever possible. All right, let's go ahead and select everything and kind of just center this on the page. Control S. Okay, all right. Let's add some additional information. Let's add a, a title here so if I press T for text label okay let's just call this 3 bit register alright and let's place that right there and then let's go to T again let's call this data input hit OK we're gonna place this in the side and then again hit T data output Okay, hit that side, and then T again, and let's just say plus five volts supply. Press enter, and let's put it over here, and then we need a label, um, I don't know, let's just uh, again, T, three bit, um, uh, data flip flop, register, and we'll put that again over here and now we can double click on it and we can change attributes about it so for example we can change the font if you click on the change font here um, you know you could choose to do bold and do a bigger font and click OK you know again um, you can sort of double click on this change the font maybe do a bold here and do a 12 click OK OK 
and then you can reposition accordingly. Control S, save. Okay, we're almost, almost done. There's a few things we have to do. First is we need to re-annotate our diagram. Annotation means that all the parts have reference numbers. Okay, J1, J3, FF1, FF2, FF3. Well, there was a problem with the Arhaya hierarchical design that we simply copy, pasted our hierarchical blocks, and that means they all have the same reference designators. So they're different, but the same at the same time, which is, <laughs> is something we don't want. So to do this, we're just going to re-annotate our design. So let's go back to Project Manager, select Design, and let's go ahead and click the U with a question mark, which is for our annotate. We're going to re-annotate our design. We're going to update the entire design. We're going to do an unconditional reference update. That means that even if they have reference designators, we want to redo it again. Okay. Um, we want to make sure that occurrences are also updated. And that's pretty much it. So if we hit OK, it'll just warn you that it'll annotate it, save it, OK. And then it annotated it. Let's do Google Control S to save it. Let's go back to our top level design. And if I double click on this, I have U1A, U2A, U1B, U2B. If I go back and double click on this, I have U1C, U2C, U1D, U2D, etc., etc. It looks like all of our parts um, all of our parts here have unique different reference designators. So we're good. Control S. Okay, now we need to do a um, design rule check, in particular an electrical rule check to make sure that we have not missed anything, we have no shorts or anything weird going on. So for that we go back to our design here and then we can click the design rules check icon. We want to do the entire design, we want to check occurrences. The most important part here is we want to check off page connectors even though we don't have them, make sure we want to check hierarchical port connections. Um, we uh, report visible unconnected power pins. You know, we just want to know everything that's going on. But here's the most important part of the design rule check, and it's the ERC matrix. And every uh, uh, layout software, schematic software, must have this. Okay. Basically, this says it lets you decide what is the urgency or how how certain events should be reported. Are they okay? Are they just warnings and you just want to know about them or are they errors? So what happens when an input is connected to an input? That's not a problem because nothing's driving neither pin is driving the other. What happens when a bi bidirectional pin is connected to an input? Nothing. What happens when a bidirectional pin is connected to a bidirectional? Well the default says it's nothing. But maybe that could be a warning. If you want to do that you click it and it changes to a W. Okay, if you click on it again, it changes to an error. If you want to leave it at the default, you can. What happens when an output gets connected to a bidirectional? It is a warning here because maybe the bidirectional is also configured as an output. What happens when two, an output is connected to an output? We have contention, it collides. So it is a warning because the bidirectional can sometimes be an input, which is okay in that situation. But what happens when an output is connected to an output? Well, that is definitely an error and it should be flagged as such. So. You have to go through this and see what's important to you, and it's based on the design, particular design, and, and you have to see what you know, what's good and what's bad. Okay, I'm gonna leave this as the default, but again, I highly encourage you to kind of look into this and make sure that that is the most important part. When you click OK, it will do a design rules check, and it will report or not report errors. Remember, where did I say information is collected? It's in the session log, so window. Session log, and then I'm going to bring this up and it checks everything. Okay, for the design rule check, and notice that there are no errors reported, so that means that it's good. What that means is that the design, logical design here, is good. Does that mean that functionally there's no error in your design? There could be, your design could be completely uh, uh, invalid, but as far as connectivity goes and making sure all the parts are connected and reference designators and you have no shorts, 
the schematic was able to catch that. It's kind of like in software where you have a compiler and you compile your code. A compiler only checks basic syntax errors, but it cannot tell you whether you have made a, a logical error or a functional error in some way. Right? The same with the schematic, you cannot assume that because you have a successful DRC that that means that your schematic is correct. Okay, so we are still looking at our schematic design and uh, we're pretty much complete. At this point, we, if you recall, we have been, uh, we did, we did a, an ERC, a DRC, a design rule check. In particular, we set up our DRC matrix and we found out that uh, there were no errors. And everything's connected and there's really nothing nothing simple that's out of the ordinary and that was uh, uh, reported by the session log where we ran the DRC and it, it told us that after after did the designs rules check that there were no errors in our design no elementary basic errors as far as the schematic is concerned okay so now we're almost ready to begin phase two but we we have to complete the most important portion of uh, our schematic design and that is assigning footprints to each of the parts of our schematic. Um, in a schematic design that is meant to be uh, uh, end up on a PCB layout stage we need to make sure that every single part in our design has a footprint assigned. This is mandatory, there is no way for you to successfully begin the PCB layout stage until you have signed a footprint to all the all your parts. So all of our connectors need footprints, and all of our gates or the packages that are or that these gates are part of require footprints. We're gonna move that in there. Um, control save. Control save the project. So how do we assign footprints, and how do we pick for footprints? This is now where the difficulty in using ORCAD begins, okay? Because there has to be a little bit of a guess and check, and finding this information is not exactly obvious. Um, so here's 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 what we're going to do. You, you, we're going to, for example, let's say we pick all the connectors first, all right? And and again, I do Control E to bring the property editor. And then I'm going to look for um, PCB footprint, which is right there. So I have four devices and have uh, ignore your yellow uh, uh, rows. Uh, we have four devices, four connectors, and we need to assign a PCB footprint. So what we need to add here, what we need to write in here, is a footprint name. Of course, we need to know what that footprint name is. All right, and many professional EDA software uh, tools, they provide a rich library of pre-made footprints of commonly used devices that you can already uh, provide onto, uh, that you can provide here, that you can enter here as a designated footprint. Okay, of course, you need to know what a footprint looks like, so let me just make not make any assumptions, and let's just go on to, let me just open a browser window, I'm going to show you some stuff. Um, let's just look at PCB footprint so that we are clear on what I'm talking about. Okay, images. All right, and uh, well, here there's a variety of examples, but let's go ahead and pick. This looks like a good image right here. View image. So these are footprints. All right, that means every physical device for which you have a symbol for a drawing. Okay has a physical mapping. All right? I keep using the word manifestation, uh, but what I really mean is mapping. A mapping from a symbol to a physical form that as, is, as it will appear on the PCB board. Okay, So these are, for example, a footprint for a uh, ball grid array BGA type package. This could be a footprint here for a uh, uh, LQFP type of, of a package, low profile. All right? Surface mount. Here are the footprints for a variety of DIP packages, dual inline uh, pin uh, packages, which is what we'll be using for this tutorial. Okay, this, these have through holes, plated through holes, that again you have to drill and it goes from one side and it comes out on the other. But all of the other, all of these, for example, these have paths that only exist on the surface on one side and not on both sides. Okay, let's look at some more examples of footprints, see what I mean. 
Um, here's an up close of one particular footprint. Let me do a view image. Okay, from a different type of program, uh, but just focus here in this area again. This is a uh, looks like a uh, let's see, uh, 39 pin, uh, 39 pin part. Okay, and again, this is uh, this could be for a chip package. This could be a microcontroller, microprocessor. Um, you know, and and this is what a footprint looks like. You you would have some kind of symbol in your schematic, but then this is what it looks like on the board. So eventually, this translates to a uh, uh, manifestation on the PCB board itself. Um, okay, let's take a look at this. Uh, let's look at some diagrams here. If I can find an actual PCB that I can show you, cancel. Oh, it won't let me go any closer, but you can see uh, again now that this is an actual physical board, and as you can see, the the physical board is composed of nothing but footprints. So in the end, the construction of a physical board in your EDA software uh, uh, toolset is basically of producing a board which uh, with a bunch of footprints aligned accordingly uh, to design uh, criteria, right? So you have a combination of through hole footprints, right? That you actually have holes uh, that go through the entire board, and then you have some of the footprints which are for surface surface mount parts, which sit sit on top of the board. And there are a variety of those bo those, those parts and in, in, in various types and and forms that that you can place on your board. So in the end, a schematic is a pictorial representation of symbols and then the PCB board is a a arra arrangement of the footprints which represent the physical mapping from the drawing to a physical manifestation okay so that's what footprint is so going back to the question um, how do you know what kind of footprint you ha you should write in here what, what what can you write in here well before I answer that question I want to show you one more thing you need to first decide. So, we have a drawing here. Let's say I have connectors or headers, or it doesn't matter what they are. These, these are interfaces between the board and something outside. This could be a connector to another connector wires. It could be just soldered wires. It could, it could, it could be a variety of things. This is just a symbol. But the part that represents the symbol, that's really up to you, based on on, on preliminary research that you do on parts that you want to use. Okay, what kind of parts are available for use? If you want to use a connector, well, what kind of connector do you want to use? Right, there, there's a variety. Here's a search where I did for shrouded header. Okay, um, of of there's a, a bunch of connectors. What kind of connector do you have to use, or do you want to use? You know, what parts do you use depends on a variety of criteria, such as environmental conditions, temperature conditions. Is the part going to go into a oven? Where you uh, 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 do uh, soldering reflow uh, for your parts, and it needs to withstand high temperatures. Is the part going to operate, or the board going to be in, in in high temperature conditions, low temperature conditions? What are the electrical characteristics and constraints of the of the part? How much current? How much power does the does the part have to be able to withstand? You know, all of these decisions come into play in you deciding. Of course. When you're starting out, you want to start out with the most common tools or most common components. And my recommendation to you is to look at, you know, a, 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 a hobbyist type of, of, of vendors such as SparkFun or uh, Adafruit, which provide some very common parts. And start with common off-the-shelf parts. But regardless of the part that you use, you need to be aware of the footprint, which comes from the mechanical drawing. Right? Let's take a view at this particular header here. Okay, um, so you have this particular hair with this many pins in here, and this is what the part looks like, right? When you mount it on the board, but the board requires through-hole pins so that the metal pins can be uh, 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 fixed onto the board itself. That means you gotta drill a hole. So this area here shows you; it, it, they call it the PCB layout. This is the footprint for this particular device. Right, and it says that you have to drill holes with a diameter of about 1.02 millimeters and a spacing of 2.54 millimeters uh, uh, among them, and a, and a row spacing also of 2.54 millimeters. Right, so you always have to look at the mechanical drawing. You need to decide on a part, and then you need to look at its mechanical drawing. And if you're lucky, 
the software tool already provides a footprint for that part but more often than not you will have to figure out how to do this on your own and the footprint part is the the authoring of, of your own custom footprints I'm gonna look at that later in a separate video but for now I'm just gonna show you some of the information you have to be aware of and this is where, where the the challenging part begins drawing a schematic is easy now this is where you have to do a little bit of work here's an example of a for example let's say your your version of a connector is a nine pin connector you need a nine pin connector well this is what the connector looks like and this is the side view and when you mount it to the board these parts right here and the pins are going to go through the board itself so that means we need to have a footprint that's going to designate how what type of holes and what's the diameter of the holes needs to be so once again we have a diameter here around 3.2 millimeters okay um, and just a quick note many mechanical drawings use dimensions of either inches or mils and, uh, and uh, millimeters okay so you need to be aware of the units I can just tell by inspection because I'm familiar with, with data sheets that this is in millimeters um, and then the diameter for the individual pins for these pins right here the uh, uh, electrical pins it's 1.09 millimeters and the spacing between holes in one row is 2.77 millimeters and the spacing in between holes alternating between rows is 1.385 millimeters so this is information you will need to make your footprints when you when you when you're making your own or if there is a footprint that already matches closely you need to verify that it follows the dimensions you cannot just pick a footprint because it looks like it might be the one you need to make some measurements and verify that that the footprint fits uh, the, the physical characteristics of the part um, battery connectors how are you going to connect the battery so for example we have here a two pin right I'm saying that I'm going to connect the supply to a two pin connector but what is the two pin connector that's up to you right you need to do some research so I looked at a, a battery connector so is it going to be this type of cables you know and connectors you need to look at mechanical drawings here's another one right here from spark fun right two pins and a connector for connecting a wire you decide what you want to do of course you just need to make sure that it has two pins but then there will be the physical manifestation what does the mechanical drawing looks like and therefore what kind of footprint are you going to need to be able to mount this part onto the PCB that is what footprints are when I'm talking about footprints uh, let's talk about logic parts so for example let's go back to our schematic back up and let's descend into one of these so we have three unique types of logic devices okay and these all are all 14 pin dips okay I want to use 14 pin dips but if you did not use 14 pin dips I use generic parts okay 7400 7400 7402 but the truth is that this is, I did this for the purpose of this tutorial but when you're doing a research the part is number is not going to be this simple because the manufacturers have a variety of logic families and, and different part categories that they provide. Case in point, let's take a look at, for example, the data sheet I'm looking at here for the 7400. And there are a variety of families 7400, 74LS7400, uh, uh, 7400, and 74S00. These have different characteristics, such as, you know, what is the propagation delay? What is the current drive? What is the current sync? What is the, the power dissipation of the device? And they vary, so you need to look at the specifications side by side and uh, make a decision. A uh, good guide, for example, made by TI, is the logic guide, which talks about the variety, the rich variety of device families. So you can have a 7400 of LBT, 7400 of fast logic, 7400 of TTL. 7400 of high speed CMOS logic type of device. Logically, they all do the same thing, but physically, they have very unique char characteristics that make each family different from the other. And this is where you have to do some research and investigation to find out there's also the logic levels and which the device operate for different device families. So, you know, um, and they, they, they do a good job of just kind of summarizing what makes each family unique and what it is used for.
Okay, again, I omitted all of that, but you need to be aware that in actuality you have very, the part numbers are far more complex. Let's go back to my sheet for 7400. The same part is available in a variety of packages, right? So I have my 14 pin dip, okay? I have an 8 pin dip for, for a different type of device. I have an LCC package type of device. It's completely different. They all do the same thing, but the different package types, right? They all have NAND gates. Okay, but the part that I wanted to show you again is let's go down to the two things device number. Okay, so I said 7400, right? But here are the actual true part names. So you could have SN7400 DG4, SN7400N, uh, SN74LS00 DG54, and of course, you know, there are different package types like SOIC. For this one, it's a pin dip, etc., etc. So you 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 have you have a lot of research to do, a lot of decisions to make before you can actually just come down to a schematic and uh, schematic and say, so this would be, for example, uh, let's say for a pin dip, and I'm just just throwing this as an example. Instead of my schematic saying seven four zero zero, which is not very indicative, you need to be specific. Now this is an obsolete part, so I would probably pick this one. SN7400N. So your schematic here should say SN7400N. And you need to be very specific for the part number. Okay? All right, let's move on to the next. So footprints, we're talking about footprints. So to know what kind of footprint you need, you need to look at the mechanical drawing of the device. There is simply no way around this. Okay? So if I want to use the pin 14 pin dip device, you need to do the most two important things is the separation between the rows of pins. Okay? So for A, that number is here 300 mils, okay? 300 thousandths of an inch. And then the separation between the two pins, okay? It says here is 100 mils. And then the whole size for each pin here is between 26 males and 14 males. So it should be 26 males, preferably a little bit longer or bigger than that um, f for it to, for the hole to be big enough for this to slip through th through the hole. Okay, so remember that. Spacing for this part is 300 males and the spacing between the pins is 100 males. So if we find a footprint that matches this characteristic, we need to verify that um, it's able to hold this package, physical uh, characteristics. So, let's go back to ORCAT, and we were talking about, let's start with the connectors. Now, let's start with the, uh, let's go in there, and let's start with the 7400s, 7402s, 740s. So, let's start with the, with the packages. Okay, how, whoops, Control z select, Holding Control C, Control E. Again, PCB footprint. I need to specify a footprint for these parts. So, what do I write in here? Okay. First question is we need to know is what type of footprints, what what kind of names we have available. To do this, you need to navigate onto your installation of Orcat. So, on my computer, I installed it on a special uh, a folder called Special Orcat Orcat Lite share PCB PCB lib symbols and the files you want to look at are the DRA and the PSM ignore the paths for the time being the DRA and PSM are the same one is compressed and one is not and they are both generated by the pap by the software tools when you're generating these footprints but that's going to be a subject of a different video but what I want you to notice is the names Whatever names you have here, excluding the extension name, whichever names that you have in this directory, these are the names that you can put in here. So let's, for example, I said that um, I need a dip part. So here are there's a variety of dip parts, of footprints that you can use. And obviously our part is a 14 pin dip, so there's only one part, a dip 14 underscore 3. Right? So that's what I would write in here. Um, under PCB footprint dip under dip 14 underscore 3 okay but 
I wanna that only this only tells me the name. I need to verify visually what does the footprint look like. Okay. Let's take for example that you were in a different situation hypothetically. Suppose that the part that we need is a twenty pin dip, right? Will you use will you write down dip twenty? Will you write down the twenty underscore three? Will you write down dip twenty underscore four? Will you write down the twenty underscore six? Which of these parts do I pick? They all have there are twenty pins. So I need to look at it. And unfortunately to do this I have to prematurely open the PCB editor. Um uh, in order for me to be able to look at the footprints, all right. So here's an example of a of a of a um, an empty. And the problem also is when we get to this, and we'll discuss this at, at length on the next video, is that once you jump into the PCB editor, you need to figure out how to even use the PCB editor in, in the PCB editor way, okay, the ORCAD PCB designer, and uh, it's just not very necessarily very intuitive you have to be very careful how to use this you get frustrated right away um, but to see the footprints you need to start a new project and I started mine on a just a temporary folder when you create create new um, and in fact let me just show you that from scratch so I'm gonna just close this I'm gonna kinda redo this again from the beginning I'm gonna save the changes and I'm gonna start my ORCAT light it's a demo version. It'll say that it is a demo version. Click yes. Uh, you can hit F10, and uh, it'll show you the previous one. That's why it reopened my. So let's just pretend it didn't. So I'm gonna say new. Uh, no, you can't see it. But I'm just gonna say new. Uh, no, and then you have to find a location to to uh, do this. So I'm I created a temporary in my ORCAD tutorial project folder. I created a folder called temp just for the time being click on it open it and then just give the board around I call the temp open click OK and it'll start a new project press F10 to view the grid or you could hit the uh, the grid icon here you can use the middle the mouse scroll bar to zoom in alright and scroll down to zoom out you can push the scroll bar down and hold it like a button to kind of pan around on the image. Okay, uh, but let's just see how to view. I just want to inspect the footprints. So to do so, we go to Place Manual here on the corner, and then the Placement Panel will come up. Okay, I want to see the package symbols, and there's nothing under package, so I need to go to Advanced Settings library go back to placement list and I can expand the list and now all of these all everything that was in the symbols directory okay is now presented here and now we just see the names and you could just you're just gonna have to go to see this for capacitors I imagine that the cap is what that means um, and then there's some standard uh, devices for uh, uh, for uh, surface mount devices and you're just gonna have to go through these um, and that's, this is the part that's kind of um, you have to you need to be familiar with standard packages okay what the what the traditional packages look like but our interest is in dip 20 our, our part is actually 14 pin um, so but I just wanted to show you let's say we needed the dip 20 I just wanted to make my point here if you check it then it'll be under the mouse and then you can click and place it okay and then go back in here uh, dip 3 I check it and then I click I place it then let's jump to dip 26 check it I place it okay are these obviously it depends on the 20 pin package but let's go ahead and click OK and dismiss this window for now and let's turn off the grid F10 okay I want to find out whether th this device has the right spacing has the right hole size and it has the right pitch between the two pins to do so you can use the measure tool once you click it the measure tool is engaged you know this because on the bottom left hand corner is this show measure and it will be so until you right click and click done or hit F6 right? 
This could be very confusing for people and problematic because you expect to press escape, which I just did to dismiss the menu, but escape is not going to exit the... If I hit the escape key, it doesn't do anything, it tries to measure, right? And this is a taste of how things are very different in ORCID capture. But anyways, my measure tool is active. I want to measure the spacing between the two rows. So, let's click here once and let's click your second and then a measure window comes up and it says that the distance is 300 mils right and then I want to measure the distance between this pin and this pin here adjacent pins and the distance is 100 mils now for our 14 pin dip package I said that that's what we needed right what about this one the spacing between this and this is 300 mils this and this is 100 mils. So these are the same package, but we need to also look at the holes. Obviously, just by looking at this, the spacing of this is 600 mils. So you need to verify that the package that you're going to use for your part has a spacing of 300 mils if it were a 20 pin device. And the spacing between these two pins is 100 mils. So the spacing between these three varieties of dip 20 footprints is the same, but the spacing between the sides is not unique. Well, it is between these two. Okay. Let's say I want to delete this parts from my window. So I have to first exit, right click, done, the measure mode. Notice that it says idle here on the corner. All right. And I want to delete it. So control D. And I'm going to select everything. And then I'm just going to click anywhere on the side and it'll go away. My delete mode is still active. So right click F6 to exit delete mode alright let's go back to place manual and I want to look at my 14 pin dip because that's what I want to use for my actual package again I'm just looking at investigating okay so this is what the package looks like let's dismiss let's click OK and uh, I'm holding down the, the, the middle mouse button and just panning then I can scroll in to push it in a little more I'm going to engage the measure tool and I'm going to measure. So from this pin to this pin, 300 mils. And from this pin to this pin is 100 mils. Now I can see, let's go back to my sheet, that that was precisely 100 mils spacing. And 300 mils uh, is it, shown here the spacing between the pins by the A. You got the table here, 300 mils. Okay. So it looks like this could be the part to do so. We dismiss this. We turn off. We exit measure mode. So right click done. All right. Um, I can right click the pen or the pad. Let's pick a different pad here. Right click on the pad and then say show element. And that will give me some information about the hole itself. And it says that it has a drill of 30, a diameter drill of 36 mils. So that's the hole. If I go back to my schematic again, the widest part of the pin needs to be maximum 26 mils. So a diameter of 36 mils will be sufficient for that pin to go through the hole. Therefore, my conclusion is that dip 14, whatever it was called, um, let's go back to my symbols here, uh, dip 14 underscore 3 will be D, and I'm going to minimize this and get back to, so I'm going to say dip 14 underscore 3 tab again, click here dip 14 underscore 3 tab click dip 14 underscore 3 tab okay, these are all the occurrences by the way, but we only do on the primary sheet so all my logic symbols, control, let's hit apply, control S to save that. Uh, what's going on here? Let's just close this panel. Let's go back here to the complete design. Click it, control S, save everything. Let's go back. So we have footprints for our, um, for our logic devices, for our parts. Now we need footprints for the connectors. And again, that depends on what type of connectors you use but again let's just take a look at what we have at our disposal is there anything that looks like header or connector 
So, let's see. We can use jumper. Probably jumper will do. What does jumper look like? So we need a 2-pin jumper, and we need a 4-pin jumper. So let's see what a jumper looks like. Oh, sorry. Let's go back to Orcat, and let's bring up the placement manual. Uh, what's going on here? There we go. Uh, let's take a look at jumper. All right, so I'm going to need a two-pin jumper. I click on it, and that's what it looks like. And I'm going to need four-pin jumpers. I click on it. That's what it looks like. I just let's see what else we have here. Do we have headers? Nope, no headers. That's it. Okay, let's zoom in on these, pan a little bit. So, now, the headers, let's take a look at the headers. So let's go back to, you know, uh, some of the drawings I was looking at. So let's say I use a standard header from a company that produces headers like these, and they produce both two-pin varieties and, you know, four-pin varieties in a single row. I'm just looking at this as an example. I'm going to make an assumption for demonstration purposes. Um, for the record, 2.54 mils, uh, millimeters is actually 100 mils. Um, so therefore, the spacing is 100 mils in every direction. So let's go back and pretending that this is the part where, again, that is only four pins wide and two pin variations only. Uh, what are the dimensions of these? Are, can these footprints called jumper be sufficient for my needs? Well, let's just see. Again, um, in the end, it's all about drilling holes or putting pads. And what, are, what are the fact that the footprint is called jumper or something else, it's not really as important. Of course, the name is, is supposed to be indicative of the part that is going to be matched with on the symbol, but you just want to find a footprint that will meet your demands. So once again, activate the measure tool, and the distance from here to here is 100 mils for this part, and the distance from here to here is 100 mils from this part. So these jumpers will be ideal for header type. Um, let me show you what a header looks like. Let's see, do I have a header? Oh, while I have this up, if you want to know about all the parts that are available and mechanical types and components and types of headers that you can use and in, 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 in the rich library of components that you have at your disposal, I highly recommend that you sign up for one of these puppies. Okay, a free catalog from Mouse and Electronic, and this will be your Bible. Just go through it all the time. Even if it goes out of date, it will be a great, a great resource for you to learn about what components, what connectors, what are they called, what's the, what's the correct, uh, 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 you know, terminology that is used for for describing parts. You need to have that. Anyways, uh, headers. Let's look at, let's just look at PCB headers. Um, is it called headers? Something like this. Okay, this is a good example. Right. A lot of a lot of uh, uh, amateur designs and for simple designs, they have things like this that you can just use and you can connect wires to. And this you get the male version. You can also do the female version connector, for example. Um, let's see if I can find some more some more images that illustrate, for example, like this. Right, you could have this. This could be a header. This could be a jumper. Right, the spacing between this will be approximately 100 mils. You need to verify. And then the drill diameter will be sufficient for you to fit the hole in it. Um, if we go back to that image, the hole, um, we'll have to convert uh, 0.64 millimeters to mils. Let's see, 0.64. It's uh, 25.19 mils. So about around 25 mils. And the hole diameter is 36 mils, so therefore we're still good. Um, Okay, let's go back. So therefore, I conclude that Jumper 2 and Jumper 4, these were the names for these particular footprints, will be sufficient for my design here, for my jumpers. So I'm going to select my jumpers. Jumper, I'm holding the Control key. Click, 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 then Control E, and find the PCB footprint entry. And, um, okay, the names, I, I can't see what the names are. So the top is input, output, and the third one is supply. Okay, the third one is the jumper two. 
and then all the other ones are going to be jumper four. Jumper four. Jumper. Jumper four. Apply. Okay, close it. Right click, close. Let's get back to our design. Select the design. Control save. Okay, so I think we're done. The design is done. It's labeled. It's beautified. It's clean. It's got title blocks. It's got additional descriptive text. For clarity, buses have net labels. Individual wires of interest have nets. In fact, um, I'm going to go ahead and when you hover the mouse over a wire, it will tell you what the net name is. Sometimes for critical key wires, you may want to relabel it so that you can find it on the PCB board when you're doing it instead of having some random name such as N00245. I'm going to push N for net alias and I'm just going to type CLK for clock, hit enter and make sure you click on the wire. And now escape. And now if I hover over the wire, the name is clock. Same here, I want to make sure I can really find BCC and ground and these are automatically labeled because the global net sometimes they label the wire that they are attached to. Okay, control S again and I think I'm done. So I have all of my parts, I have all the parts have references designators, all of the refer reference designators are unique among my occurrences um, I did the DRC check, it passed, and I did a uh, footprint for all the parts, and it's good. So we are ready to generate the uh, netlist, which is the final step. The netlist is, as, as the name implies, it is a list of nets that uh, uh, specify the connectivity of your entire design. In other words, what is connected to what. That's what a netlist is. So, how do we generate a netlist? We go back to uh, Project Work uh, Manager, select the design, and then click on this icon, create netlist. Okay, we go ahead and create the net, uh, click on the icon, the create netlist panel shows up. Okay, uh, leave everything by default. Okay, um, let's go ahead and click on that, create or update PCB editor. Now, when you're creating a brand new PCB board, and that is what we're doing right now, the first entry should be empty. The second entry is where your name of the board will be placed. By default, it will be placed into a folder called Allegro, and then the name of your project will be used as the name of the board. So the .brd file will be your netlist board, and it will be the PCB board itself. In addition, um, board launching options by default after the create netlist is done once that is successful it will automatically open the board file in the PCB editor which is fine if you have a paid license if you have a demo version I recommend that you do not open the board file and do that separately because because it is a demo it will fail okay now suppose you make a change to your schematic and you need to change the board let's say you are, you are already in phase two you're working on your PCB layout and you decided to make a change you need to go back to the schematic well you go back to the schematic but then you need to specify as an import board file the same board file if you leave this empty and you make a change to your schematic that you want to reflect onto your board later on um, it won't happen so again just FYI, keep that in mind. But for the time being, we're creating the, the netlist for the first time, therefore the input board file has to be empty. Alright, and that, this is all we need. We don't need to look at anything else. Let's just hit OK. And if we're, it'll say um, it, that the, the Allegro folder does not exist, so it'll create it automatically. Just say yes, and then it's doing its thing. And if we have no issues, and how do we find out? We need to look at window session log okay and it's creating the netlist the board file let's see it, it, it looks like it starts from so here's when we need the DRC and here's when we need the 
netlist generation and you look for, if there's an error first of all it will fail and you can look at this you know to see if there's anything that grabs your attention but it doesn't look that there's any errors so therefore the netlist is good let's take a look at our portfolio oh let's save it control s so we're done ladies and gentlemen now we're ready to start phase two now let's take a look at our project folder okay so i'm looking at orcat tutorial that's where the folder i created i double click on it and we have our design file which is part of our of our specific design and then there's the orcat project file so your design file is actually contained inside of a orcat project file so everything goes together um, and then allegro is the folder that was created specifically for the pcb so if we go in here double click on it here's the information but our key file is this file right there and that is the board file that we're going to use to begin phase two which is the um, now the layout phase of our existing schematic design here and to do that that's we're going to cover that into a second video so um, that concludes uh, uh, this video this this first part of the video um, I hope that it was helpful for you helpful for you and uh, that's it. Uh, look for the second video, second part, and and get started. Like I said, um, PCB, uh, 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 you know, the uh, ORCAD part, the capture, the schematic portion, the software. I think is very intuitive. You know, it's very well thought out. Everything works the way you expect it. You use the mouse to move. You use the left mouse button to click and select, and you can just select everything and click and drag things out of place if you want to lay a wire you press the W if you want to place a part you press the P if you want to place a note connect with an X you just hit the X key everything is very intuitive okay when we go except for the footprint part it requires investigation it requires you to have a lot of information ahead of time a lot of knowledge okay you need to do research parts part numbers footprints does it exist? What do I have? You have to work within the constraints of the demonstration version. That's that's the other th the thing. I, I want to make it clear that the full version license has a very rich library. But in either case, and in my personal experience, I almost always find myself having to make my own footprints because you just cannot make footprints for every possible part. It's just not realistic. So it's a skill you have to know. You have to know how to make footprints. So you're going to look at, at that in a separate video. We're trying to restrict ourselves here into trying to just make use of the demo and trying to make use of the, the resources that are available by way of the demo software. Okay. Another thing I wanted to make clear is that, again, there's no special, even though it's nothing special about a footprint. It is just basically, it says, where are the holes going to be? What are the hole sizes? What are the, are there information such as the solder mask and, and, and things like that? We're going to discuss that later. Okay, but it's not, even though this was called jumper, I can connect, I can use the jumper footprint to connect any device that has a spacing of 100 mils. A whole diameter is at least that, that, that fits this. Uh, and the same thing. Uh, uh, this. So this, this, I can use this pattern to just solder wires into it. I can stick wires into these holes if this is small enough. I could use a header, a two-pin header, a male type two-pin header. I can use the same footprint to hook up a a, a two-pin female header. I can use the same footprint to hook up, uh, you know, a shrouded header. Um, you know, uh, I could maybe use even use the same footprint to to connect a capacitor in it. If you know, if you bend the pins a little bit and stick them through there. So there's really nothing special about the footprint name, other than you need to make sure that mechanically the footprint can meet the the requirements of the parts that you're using from a physical dimension standpoint. Um, for mass production, this is actually very important. You, you need to be very meticulous. For personal work, for hobbyist work, you know, you can normally, if you miss a little bit, you can kind of bend the pins and kind of uh, uh, get the part in there. But of course, this is you got to be perfect when you're doing this professionally. But there's really nothing special about naming. So I'm saying that because when you I want you to, to research, I want you to get in here and just to lay parts, see what they look like. Another good strategy is um, you can print, you know, many people, and I do this myself, print what you have here onto a sheet of paper and make sure that the scaling of the print is one to one. That means that 
the exact dimensions here will be the scaling of the printout will be exactly as it will be if you actually had the board fabricated so that means you can look at these footprints on a sheet of paper and if you happen to have the parts in question already let's say you purchased purchased the parts already you can just go ahead and place the parts on your sheet of paper and see if the pins line up right and you will be able to tell right away whether you are way off or whether you need to rethink your strategy okay the footprint thing the footprint question must be known, must be decided, must be finalized. You just cannot go through a complete design and then find out that your footprints are war are wrong. This is a complete disaster. You need to know what footprints you're going to use and you need to be sure, 100% certain, it will do the job for your particular needs before you do anything further. I haven't done anything. I haven't started layout. I haven't done nothing. All I'm doing is evaluating the suitability of these footprints for my parts. That is a very important message and it's the most important part before you finish the schematic design in ORCAD and move on to create the, gen, uh, create the net list and move on to uh, the PCB layout. Okay, so that's it. Let's go ahead and stop here. Thank you for your patience and your time and uh, go take a look at the second video. It's phase 2 PCB layout in ORCAD. Thank you.